Welcome to another big train tour at the Colorado Railroad Museum. Today, we'll be taking a look at Denver and Rio Grande caboose number 49. This brightly colored car dates to 1881 and the early days of narrow gauge railroading expansion in Colorado. Acquired by the museum in 1984 as just a body, this rare survivor has been completely restored and is today proudly displayed here in Golden. Hi, I'm Paul Hammond, Executive Director of the Colorado Railroad Museum. Our subject this week is a tiny four-wheeled bobber caboose built by the Denver and Rio Grande in its own shops. Like many rail vehicles, and especially narrow gauge ones, caboose number 49 was rebuilt, repainted, and renumbered at various points throughout its life, and then retired and almost lost. Its very existence today provides a powerful connection with Colorado freight railroading, changes in the railroad safety environment, and the many railroad workers who helped shape the expansion and settlement of our nation. Even today, the caboose remains a popular icon of children's stories and popular American culture. From the mid-19th century all the way through the 1980s, a caboose brought up the rear of most freight trains, with a train crew giving a friendly wave to trackside observers as it passed. But for the most part today, this familiar rail vehicle has all but vanished from railroading itself. The reasons are many, but they can all be summed up in just two sentences. The caboose was originally created to solve a variety of needs. These needs no longer exist on America's railroads, so the caboose has been replaced by technology. Today, instead of a caboose, a small box with a blinking light typically is found at the end of a freight train. This device monitors brake pipe pressure for the air brake system, assists in actuating the system in case of emergency, and transmits information directly to train crews electronically. The railroad operating environment in the 19th century was immensely different from what it is today. Especially here in the Rocky Mountains, trains were typically short. Steam locomotives would improve and become more powerful as the 20th century approached, but in the 1870s they were typically not all that powerful. When pulling a train up a steep grade, locomotive driving wheels would slip or the engine simply couldn't budge the train if too much tonnage was added. Equally important, when coming down the other side of the mountain, the speed of the descending train had to be closely controlled. Air brakes were not yet in common usage. Nor, for that matter, was any other form of automatic brakes. The locomotive engineer had only cylinder back pressure, as well as a single handbrake on the locomotive's tender at his immediate command. These two means were far from sufficient to stop a heavy train on a steep mountain grade. Brakes needed to be applied on each individual car, and the method of applying these brakes was pretty primitive. When the engineer knew he needed to slow the train or to stop, he would signal his crew to do the work of applying the brakes individually on each car. A whistle signal was most commonly used because any other kind of signal might well have gone unnoticed. The signal was a message to the train's brakeman. Depending on the exact sequence and intensity of the whistle sounds, the engineer might be telling them to slowly apply the brakes to bring the train's speed down, or he might be telling the brakeman to stop the train immediately. But no matter what the signal, the brakeman did the actual work of applying the bricks by hand, one car at a time. In this environment, not surprisingly, multiple brakemen were assigned to each train. It was dangerous work because it was easy to be thrown off the tops of cars or to fall overboard while yanking on a brake meal with a stick. The job of brakemen was also filled with risk because of the other duties that were involved. Railroad work was some of the most dangerous in the 19th century, and the job of brakeman was perhaps the most dangerous of all. 
The link and pin coupler was the standard on the Denver and Rio Grande in the late 19th century, and brakemen needed to work with the engine crew to push cars into position and then drop the pin into a link at precisely the correct moment. Uncoupling was just as challenging. Sight lines were pretty much non-existent at critical times, so many things could and did go wrong. Any miscalculation or error on the brakeman's part might result in the loss of a finger, the amputation of a hand or a leg, sometimes even life itself. So what does all of this have to do with our caboose anyway? Well, in the 19th century, freight trains typically had brakemen assigned to the rear of the train as well as to the front. Those forward brakemen assigned to the front of the train would likely find refuge in the engine cab until they were called into action. Later, small shanty-type structures were added atop the rear of tenders for those forward brakemen to ride in. Those stationed at the back of the train also needed a place to ride, and so too did the train's conductor. The caboose was the place for these trainmen to find refuge from the weather, and also to remain vigilant and observe the train as the trip progressed. Inside the caboose, the brakeman could climb into the cupola to watch the train ahead for any signs of overheating axle bearings, dragging brakes, derailment, or other danger. After the advent of air brakes at the beginning of the 20th century, they also would monitor the main brake pipe pressure gauge mounted inside the caboose. Any drop in pressure could spell trouble and impede the train's stopping ability. If a brakeman spotted smoke coming from the train, he would signal the engineer to stop so an inspection could be made. The problem might be an overheating journal, where a machine bearing rides atop the bearing surface of the axle, bathed in oil, carried to the bearing via a stringy mass called journal waste. If this were the case, the waste would need to be pulled from the box and a new mass installed and oiled up. The problem might also be sticking or dragging brake shoes. If the brake shoes and wheels got too hot, they would not only smoke, but also could cause other problems, such as shattered wheels and axles. There was a lot to watch for. The conductor, who was the actual captain of the train, would go about his duties filling out paperwork documenting each freight car's identity and contents. A desk inside the caboose made his task much easier. Although they weren't originally installed, Coal stoves were eventually added to provide heat, as well as a place to heat up water for coffee or even to cook a quick meal. There were even places to take a nap or sleep, depending on the length of the run and other factors. No wonder that many trainmen referred to the caboose as their home away from home. Our caboose, number 49, dates from 1881. It was one of 88 pretty much identical four-wheel cabooses built for the Denver and Rio Grande between 1871 and 1885. The first four were built by car builder Jackson and Sharp of Wilmington, Delaware. The Denver and Rio Grande itself then built the remaining 84 cars at the company's shops in Denver and Alamosa. The Rio Grande was expanding rapidly during this time, and freight traffic was growing exponentially. The company was constantly acquiring new locomotives and freight cars during this time as well. Little number 49 has a body that is just 16 feet long, sitting atop a frame that's slightly less than 21 feet in length, including the car's two end platforms. It's constructed completely of wood, with steel and iron used sparingly in places such as the end platform railings, wheels and axles, and truck assembly. The car's journals are spaced just nine feet apart, and they're sprung longitudinally with leaf springs being equalized by a long, level bar that pivots in the middle of the car's underside. This car undoubtedly was rough riding, but thankfully the trains it was attached to were not typically going terribly fast. By the way, what's that box on top of the cupola? Well. It was a place at night where trainmen could add a lantern inside to signal the engineer. 
1885, the railroad built more cabooses to the same basic pattern. But instead of having just four wheels total, these new cabooses featured two individual swiveling four-wheeled trucks, which is a railroad term for wheel set assembly. The individual trucks added stability and made for a smoother ride, and all Rio Grande cabooses thereafter were built with eight wheels rather than the original standard of four. In 1887, the railroad decided to renumber all of its cabooses into a new series starting with 0500. Little number 49 was renumbered 0548 at that time, but otherwise it continued in service unchanged with four wheels. Originally built with 10 windows, two on each of the ends and three on each side, number 49 soon saw some of those windows covered over. A stove was installed around 1886 for the train crew's comfort. Imagine riding in this caboose in winter without a stove. The biggest changes, however, would come about because of major shifts in the railroad safety environment. The U.S. government, spurred on by railroad workers and concerned citizens, would dictate that air brakes and so-called automatic couplers would become standard equipment on most of the country's railroads by the turn of the 20th century. These new air brakes and automatic couplers help train lengths to subsequently increase. Together with the introduction of more powerful locomotives, train speeds also increased, although these increases mostly benefited the Rio Grande's standard gauge trains. With safety regulations broadening to mandate ladders and grab irons for crew safety by 1913, these too were added to caboose number 0548. Another major improvement was legislation limiting the number of hours that could be worked at any single time. Imagine the job of a brakeman before these changes were legislated by Congress. Sometime after 1918, our caboose was rebuilt itself into an eight-wheel car. It continued to travel across the Denver and Rio Grande's narrow-gauge system, visiting places such as Durango and Silverton, Alamosa, and Adenito along the way. Very little is known about the car's exact travels during this time, other than what's been documented in photographs. For 57 years, it went about its end-of-train duties. But by the late 1930s, as traffic on the Rio Grande's narrow-gauge system declined and some narrow-gauge routes were abandoned, it was no longer needed. The car body, stripped of its wheel sets and underbody mechanical gear, was sold to an Animus River placer mining company for use as a bunkhouse. Sometime in the 1970s, a restaurant north of Durango obtained the body with the idea of restoring it. That didn't pan out, and the car was instead donated to an historical society, then re-gifted to the Durango and Silverton narrow gauge. After yet another trade, the Colorado Railroad Museum in 1984 purchased the dilapidated car body. It was loaded onto a trailer in Durango and transported to Golden, Colorado. An in-depth, well-researched, and precisely executed restoration project was undertaken starting in the late 1980s. The goal was to return the car to its 1881 appearance, but deterioration of the original wood was such that most pieces had to be made new. Plenty of other parts had to be either found used or replicated. It was an enormous project, and the museum did not yet have an indoor space for performing such work. The museum's roundhouse would be completed as this project was approaching fruition. The fully restored caboose, which once again sported four wheels and all of its running gear, was rolled out in fall 1992. Since that time, this little red caboose has been a favorite of guests to the museum. Number 49 remains an icon today, not only of early Colorado narrow gauge railroading, but also the evolution of railroad safety. Today, it serves as a tribute to the many railroad workers who helped shape the expansion and settlement of the Centennial State and all of America. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you've enjoyed our tour of Denver and Rio Grande Caboose number 49. I also hope that your appreciation for Colorado's rich railroad heritage continues to grow with each and every tour of the museum's collections.
Like, comment, share, and subscribe. Commenting and sharing in particular may qualify as virtual engagements for important funding programs like the SCFD.